Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. Today we are going to discuss studying audiences, texts, institutions. This lecture is a part of your paper on communication research. As communication researchers, we are interested in the media phenomena which has different sides to it. Potter in 1996 writes of audiences, texts and institutions as three facets of the media phenomena. He reminds us that he uses the term facets rather than components because they cannot be taken apart like components can. He notes that researchers, especially qualitative communications researchers in media studies who are primarily concerned with meaning making need to engage with all three facets. However, since this would be too resource intensive, researchers are forced to engage with one facet at a time. Potter in 1996 emphasizes that this does not mean that the other facets are not of importance. They continue to be parts of the phenomena but are kept in the background. Potter's description in 1996 provides us with an approach to understand the interconnected nature of these three areas of the communications phenomena. Approaching the communications phenomena as being composed of these three interconnected areas is fairly popular and we can see it in the number of books that have been published using this approach such as Media Studies, Texts, Institutions and Audiences by Lisa Taylor and Andrew Willis in 1999. Media Research Methods, Audiences, Institutions, Texts by Ina Bertrand and Peter Hughes in 2004 and Media Institutions and Audiences Key Concepts in Media Studies by Nick Lacey in 2002. This lecture will provide us an overview of communications research from these three areas so that students can read about a wide variety of communications research studies and have a road map of potential avenues that they can explore. We will examine the main data collection methods, some theories and research studies associated with each of these three facets of the media phenomenon, audiences, texts and institutions. Audiences. So, let us start with the audiences. Audience research has a long and rich history from the earliest days of mass media. For example, the Pine Foundation studies were used to examine the change in adolescents' attitudes due to movie viewing, surveys, experiments, interviews, focus groups and ethnographies are the main data collection methods in audience research. The survey method is the most popular quantitative method used to gather primary data from audience members. You will be familiar with the Census of India which uses a personally administered survey to capture quantitative household data. The survey method involves the creation of a questionnaire by the researchers. The survey is then administered either in person or via telephone, mail or email to a sample of respondents who record their responses to the best of their ability. These responses are tabulated and subjected to statistical analysis. A 
A useful example is Armstrong and Neuendorf's research study in 1992 using the theoretical framework of the construction of social reality to survey white American students regarding their television viewing and racial beliefs. They found that white students who watched entertainment programming believed that black Americans had high incomes than the average incomes of white Americans. White American students who watched the news believed that black Americans had lower incomes than the average incomes of white Americans. The experiment method is the second, although more expensive method that is used to gather quantitative data from audience members. Participants are divided into groups based on the different conditions of content that they are to receive. Measures are conducted before and after the administration of the content and the data is subjected to statistical analysis. Hankin in 2016 conducted an experiment using Facebook status updates and found that Facebook friends responded to status updates of their friends who had voted and proceeded to vote themselves compared to those in a control group who did not receive such updates. Qualitative methods to gather data from audiences include in-depth interviews, focus groups and ethnographies. In research studies using in-depth interviews, a small sample of participants is identified and the researcher spends many hours interviewing each individual participant in his or her natural setting. The interviews are recorded and transcribed. The data is analyzed using inductive methods such as the constant comparison technique or the analytic induction technique. Burglars in 2011 conducted in-depth interviews with 14 environment journalists in Sweden using how the media logic theoretical framework affects climate change reporting as opposed to say how science reports climate change. Media logic is the specific way in which the media communicate such as the style of communication and the way stories are framed. Journalists also spoke of their individual creativity in fitting the climate change issue into the existing way in which news stories were framed. Research studies using the focus group method assemble a homogeneous group of participants and observe their discussion on the specified topic. The researcher moderates the discussion, which is recorded, transcribed and analyzed. Scott in 2014 used the focus group method to explore British audience members' responses to suffering of people that they viewed on television. He found that while viewing news programs did not affect audiences much. Factual non-news programs such as documentaries had a greater ability to move audience members. The ethnographic method involves field observation and interviews of the participants in their natural settings. These observations and interviews are transcribed and analyzed as in the other qualitative methods we just discussed. Macmillan in 2003 used a critical feminist approach in her study of the role played by television advertising in the lives of unskilled
female factory workers working in Bengaluru. She found that these audience members invested in their image and appearance to conform to the images they viewed on television as means of hope and empowerment rather than in long-term financial investments that would improve their economic situation. Audience research methods are continually evolving to match new media. Unobtrusive data is now collected from devices such as smartphones. This method eliminates any errors that might arise from self-reporting of data by audience members. Audience members are often unable to accurately report on their actions. For instance, Williams et al. in 2009 found that female video gamers played for longer periods of time than male gamers but underreported the time they spent gaming, perhaps because of the lack of social sanction for such activities based on gender. While both genders underreported the time they spent gaming, unobtrusive methods showed that the discrepancy was greater for females. The social desirability bias is another area of potential error in face-to-face -face data collection from audience members. For questions on topics that are sensitive, audience members may prefer to give a response that they feel is socially acceptable rather than report facts. However, all these errors can be eliminated through careful research design. Now we will examine research on media texts. Media texts include all forms of media content such as films, television shows, newspapers, magazines, music, digital media content and so on. Content analysis is typically the method used in the study of media texts. The main requirement is that the content be recorded in some form so that the researcher can return to it again and again in the process of coding. The content analysis method involves a close and careful reading of media content. This method is used in both the quantitative and qualitative approaches. In the quantitative content analysis, researchers develop a coding protocol and instrument to code the content into categories which can then be quantified and subjected to statistical analysis. Researchers developing the cultivation theory such as Signorelli in 2013 have successfully used the quantitative content analysis method to examine American television content. Signorelli in 2013 presents a content analysis of a large data set consisting of 783 programs and 3,268 characters from 2000 to 2009, which found that while race-related violence had reduced over a period of time, gender differences continued to be observed with more male characters involved in violence than women. She also notes that by and large American television content sends out an overall message supporting the use of violence because characters who committed violence did not appear repentant.
The quantitative content analysis method is also used extensively in research studies that develop the agenda setting and framing theories. Rauch et al. in 2007 examined the framing of democratic globalization protesters in the New York Times from 1999 to 2004 and found that stories on these protests began to frame them as time passed and frames that delegitimized these protests became much less. This study showed that while the frames used in new stories remain unchanged over a period of time as predicted by theory, the number of times a frame is used may increase or decrease based on the time. Qualitative content analysis are also used in theory development. Content is coded into categories which are then subjected to qualitative analysis. Becker et al. in 2016 conducted a qualitative content analysis from a feminist perspective of children's films promoting the Bratz brand of dolls targeted at girls. They found that the films promoted a group orientation over an individual orientation but only as a means to encourage conformist consumerism. The group orientation promoted was a beauty oriented group orientation which aims at a non-political middle ground. While media audiences and content are popular areas of research, far less attention is given to the context within which texts are created and consumed. Now we will explore research into media contexts. The study of institutions which shape the context within which communications occurs includes policy studies, media economies and the political economy approach. All three approaches use a combination of document and secondary data analysis. Policy studies examine the role of government in the communication phenomena. Governments regulate communications markets through the creation of regulations regarding ownership, censorship, taxation and various other matters within their purview. McDowell's study in 1997 on the Indian government's policy response to globalization, specifically on the satellite television channels, is a useful example of the clarity that policy studies bring to our understanding of the content within which audiences consume media texts. Through an analysis of news reports of the government's pronouncements on television policy, McDowell in 1997 argued that the Indian government's response to globalization in the television sector resulted in strengthening the government-owned media and the creation of alliances with transnational capital and local capital even as development or public service oriented media were ignored. Media economics uses economic analysis to understand market structure and issues such as the media trade among others. Chitrapu in 2012 presents a media economics study of how film market size in the regional language film markets in India affects the output of these regional language film industries and the trade in regional language films. 
this study presented an analysis of secondary data obtained from the censors and the Central Board of Film Certification. The political economy approach examines power relations in the communications phenomena and how it influences media content availability and consumption by audiences. Pendakur's research study in 1985 on the support provided by the American government to Hollywood film industries expansion plans in India is a valuable example of the political economy approach being applied to the film trade in India. Using interviews with key informants and official documents, Pindakur in 1985 showed how the Hollywood film studios were able to function as a cartel which stifles competition in India while they were expressly prohibited from doing so within their own country. Another revealing example is Srinivas's study in 1996 of fan associations which reveals the relationships that are cultivated by the South Indian film industry with fan associations of stars as a response to the government's policies on taxation on film viewing. This study uses interviews with key informants and publications of fan associations. Investigations into media institutions provide crucial background for research on media audiences and content. In the absence of knowledge about context, critical understandings about the power relations among the forces that play a role in the shaping and distribution of content that could make analysis sharper could end up being overlooked. Summary. Let us now try and summarize what we discussed in the lecture. The lecture presents an overview of research on audiences texts and institutions which are three facets of the media phenomena. We explored quantitative audience research using the survey and experiment methods to collect data from audience members. We also noted the qualitative methods used to gather data from audiences including in-depth interviews focus groups and ethnographies. Inductive methods such as the constant comparison technique or the analytic induction technique are used to analyze qualitative data. In-depth interviews are conducted within a small sample of participants in his or her natural setting. The focus group methods gather data from a homogeneous group of participants. In ethnographies, field observation and interviews of the participants in their natural settings is used to generate the data. Media texts are studied through content analysis both quantitative and qualitative. In the quantitative content analysis, researchers develop a coding protocol and instrument to code the content into categories which can then be quantified and subjected to statistical analysis. Content analysis can also be conducted using a qualitative approach. Policy studies, media economics and the political economy approach are used to study the context within which the media phenomena takes place. All three approaches use a combination of document 
and secondary data analysis. Policy studies examine the role of government in the communication phenomena. Media economics uses economic analysis to understand market structure and issues such as the media trade among others. The political economy approach examines power relations in the communications phenomena and how it influences media content availability and consumption by audiences. The research studies we discussed are from a number of different national contexts and reveal international best practices in communications research. Given India's diverse media phenomena, which exist due to heterogeneity of language, socio-economic distribution of population, and localized media cultures, there are several situations which demand investigation and explanation. We encourage you to keep track of the research studies that you enjoy reading and think of how you can contribute to the theories developed in those studies using empirical data from your own media contexts. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Do attempt the questions in the self-evaluate quadrant. For further reading suggestions, please refer to the third quadrant. Thank you.